I'm Fonzo. And I'm Aliza. And we're the co-host of Grown, a podcast from the moth that shows we're never fully grown. Growing up feels like a phase that should end at some point, but does it ever really? Whether you're 16 or 26 or 86, you're going to have to deal with family drama, your body, and the type of person you want to be. So why not put it all out in the open and go through it together? Join us every other week to deal with cringe, culture, and the courageous efforts of people like you to get grown. Start listening today. Follow Grown on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. I didn't see my first kiss coming. It happened when I was in middle school. Robin. She was going out with my best friend, Ted. At a classmate's party, word spread that she dumped Ted and that she liked me. I was scared. My friend sent me into a room where Robin was sitting alone on a couch. I sat next to her, and suddenly her tongue was halfway down my throat. Apparently my friends were all watching, including Leslie, who had a camera. I haven't seen the picture since it made the rounds in middle school. What I do remember clearly is that you couldn't see her face, just her hands on the back of my head, gripping it like she was a gorilla cracking open a coconut tea. My first kiss was in a play when I was in 8th grade, and the boy I was playing opposite was the most popular boy in school. And I thought he was very cute, but every night before we had to do the kiss, he would lick his lips, and every night it would just make me cringe. I was probably in 6th or 7th grade at a friend's birthday party. And at that party, they decided to play essentially spin the bottle. I kissed many different girls uh, at that party. And while I do remember my first kiss, it was making out in front of the group and making out for at least two minutes. It's embarrassing because I wish I had a better story. I wish I knew the person that I kissed first. I do remember kissing my first girlfriend as well. And that feels more like my first kiss. That was Lawrence, Caroline, and Stephen. I'm Anita Rao, and this is Embodied, our show about sex, relationships, and your health. I like to think about the moments before a first kiss as a kind of dance. For me, back in eighth grade, that very first dance looked like two strangers trying to avoid running into each other on the sidewalk. All missteps. No grace. At that point, my middle school boyfriend and I had been dating for a few months. We sat next to each other every day on the bus and passed notes in pre-algebra, but pretty much avoided ever being alone together. One fall afternoon, I suggested we meet up to walk our dogs around the neighborhood, and I was pretty sure this was the moment it was going to happen. But after four trips around the block, I lost hope. So I hugged him goodbye, and then quickly stood up on my tiptoes and kissed him on the cheek. As I hurriedly walked away, I yelled behind me, well, you were never gonna do anything. Next thing I knew, he had caught up to me. He leaned down, and well, you know how the rest of the story goes. Thankfully, I've had many more first kisses since eighth grade that were so much less awkward. But one thing that's remained the same is how much more memorable the first kiss of a relationship is than all the ones that come after. There's this almost immediate sense of, yes, I'd like more of this. Or no, I'd be happy to never kiss this person again. So that memory is powerful. And part of the reason is because we're engaging all of our senses. And there's even been research looking at different firsts in our lives and how vivid different details of those experiences are from first sexual experience to first kiss. And first kiss wound up being the moment that people can remember the most about uh, in the significant relationships in their lives. And so it is a really powerful memory for us. That's Cheryl Kirschenbaum a scientist and author at Michigan State University. She never set out to become a kissing specialist. In fact, if you time traveled to meet her 20 years ago, you'd likely find her dissecting a sea cucumber in a marine lab. 
So how do you get from marine biology to kissing? Well, it started with a short one-off piece she wrote in 2008 for Valentine's Day. The response to that piece about kissing was so overwhelming that she decided to look into what other information was out there. Turns out there wasn't much. And that's how the journey to writing her book, The Science of Kissing, began. She starts with that most fundamental question. Why do we kiss? Is it nature or nurture? In the end, I think it's really a compliment. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a bit of both. So we have what we call the proximate reasons and the ultimate reasons. The proximate reasons are what's going on in our own lives. Why do we express ourselves this way? And for most of us, our earliest experiences, feeling comfort, security, love, involve some kind of lip stimulation, whether it's through nursing or even bottle feeding. Other cultures use pre-mastication to feed their infants, which is the pre-chewing of food. Or whether it's just like what we would recognize as a kiss on the lips, a kiss on the forehead. So it lays down neural pathways in our brain that later in life when we want to express how we feel with different people that we love, we often express ourselves through a kiss. Now, the ultimate reasons have to do with, um, you know, why is this beneficial for our species? And that has everything to do with being attracted to the color of lips, being red, because red was often in our ancestors and other primates. Uh, Red could indicate fruit that was ripe. It was a color that we're primed as individuals and as communities to seek out for sustenance. Also, the lips are packed with sensitive nerve endings. So even a slight brush against the lips is going to feel very powerful for us as individuals. In the end, it is all about connection. I feel like we need to do a whole show just about the lips because, y'all, they are so underrated. Our lips are our most exposed erogenous zones and one of the most sensitive places on our bodies. Cheryl's book has this really wild image of a sculpture crafted to represent the relationship between each part of our body and the proportion of brain tissue dedicated to processing sensory information that comes from it. And the lips and tongue are huge compared to the other features because they contain so many nerve endings. So what happens when your lips touch someone else's? What information is it that gets sent to the brain? There is just so much going on. And I guess the first part of that is, is this someone that we want to be kissing? Is this a romantic kiss? Are we feeling comfortable because stress and kissing don't mix? If it's a really stressful situation or an environment where we're not comfortable, you get a spike in cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and it's not going to feel so good. But if we assume that everything is just right and this is someone that you've really been interested in, especially for a long time, then you get a spike in a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And dopamine is famously associated with craving and desire It's that can't wait to have something or someone kind of feeling. And that can go way up during a first kiss. We also have a spike in norepinephrine or adrenaline. So our heart races, uh, our palms might sweat, our pulse quickens, our pupils can dilate, which is one reason we think so many people close their eyes when they kiss because there's that involuntary dilation of pupils and we close our eyes. Oxytocin, which we often call the love hormone, That is involved as well. It's very associated with connection and comfort and security. And that can definitely be induced through kissing and cuddling and hugging. And we use those signals to help us figure out what comes next. Is if it's a pleasurable experience, you know, do we decide to do something more or do we just enjoy that kiss itself? So we've been alluding a lot to romantic kissing so far. And I want to broaden out a little bit to talk about the many other kinds of kiss. There's the platonic kiss on the cheek greeting that's common in a lot of European cultures. There are kisses with and without tongue. Of course, we have the French kiss. So talk about how kissing has evolved to meet these wide variety of needs for connection. The shape and the style that kissing takes in any given place is entirely influenced by culture. So if we're reading about romantic kisses in literature, and we're reading Romeo and Juliet, if we're seeing kissing in film and television on billboards, that is going to affect our own impressions of what it should look like and how it should take place. And of course, this is well beyond romantic kissing, as you're saying. Kiss greetings are so common in Europe, in different parts of Central America, South America. And it has to do with just what's familiar to that community, what's accepted. And so there is no wrong way to do it. And we've seen kissing spread, you know, 
kissing spread in certain places during world wars because different communities were encountering each other uh, and greeting each other who had really not had those opportunities before. And of course, French kissing isn't a term that the French even came up with. It, it was kind of a saying because French women were considered very warm. And when different soldiers were traveling and wound up in France, there was a saying, oh, when you're in France, get the girls to kiss you. And that kind of changed in style and language to get a French kiss. And now that's associated with a tongue kiss. And some other cultures call it soul kissing. Um, so there's all sorts of different words for it. My first kiss, and I will date myself, was in Kevin Costner's movie, Robin Hood. And the boy I went to the movie with turned my chin towards him and started kissing me, and I didn't like it. So I grabbed his hands eventually and held them captive on the movie theater seat between us. Sometime later, he tugged at his hands and I held tighter and he said, I have to scratch my contact. And I let his hands go. And that story makes so much more sense now, 30 years later, when I realize that I am asexual and I don't like some forms of physicality and signs of affection, but it took me a long time to figure that out. That's a listener from Texas named Kristen. How comfortable you feel kissing someone or receiving affection shifts not only as you age and make sense of your identity, but also as you move through geographic space and take note of how others respond to you. Photographer Kadar Small has been documenting public displays of affection in New York City for years. But his awareness of how people read queer bodies and queer intimacy dates back to when he was a 10th grader in Atlanta, Georgia. It was during um, the spring, I believe. It was some sort of like campfire party that we were doing. And this one particular night, these two um, popular students were like talking to each other, these two guys, and they like go towards the back of the woods and they start kissing, making out. They thought they were alone, but little did they know it, a whole bunch of people were like staring at them. So when they came out, they came out a little bit embarrassed. One left and the other one left with his friends. The next day at school was very interesting because again, like I said, these students were very well known and popular. So I thought it would probably be embraced, especially me being from New York. Um, but being down south, I got to see more of these black students get ridiculed and be judged just for sharing a kiss and for liking one another. And that was very, very shocking for me. I wasn't out at the time, but I definitely was not coming out as bisexual when I saw that happen. No, I mean, that sounds like a very hostile environment and obviously hard to feel comfortable expressing yourself. As you got older, you moved back to New York City um, and you started photographing. You started photographing at nightclubs and had a lot more exposure to open queer culture. What was that transition like and, and how did your conception of kissing evolve? Um, I have to say, going back home, I would say like I got to really come out of my shell. That's when I was like, oh, wow, like this is the sort of environment that I really enjoy and that I really like. And that's what really got me into thinking about this photo series that I'm shooting currently, PDA, Public Display of Affection. Yeah, I'd love to know more about that and then the story behind the project in particular. Yes, yeah, so PDA, Public Display of Affection, is an ongoing photo series about the BIPOC community normalizing, showing intimate moments in domestic and public spaces, specifically the court community. So I'm documenting individuals that have been dating for six plus months, some for two years and so on. And I'm also documenting queer singles um, and documenting their personal journeys because I really believe that you can't love anybody else until you learn how to love yourself first. These photographs are so, so beautiful and there's so much texture and so many different emotions that are coming through in each of the images. How did people that you encountered in public react to y'all shooting? Um, so it was very interesting. So especially with being living in New York City, like I said, New York City is very progressive, but there's still parts of New York City that are still very homophobic. So for instance, I remember one time when I was shooting my two sitters, um, Zay and Tiff, their pronouns are she, her, both of them. And they were explaining to me 
um, just like their experience with PDA and what they were comfortable with. And then we started it out in Crown Heights at a park. Regular kissing scene, the sun was hitting them so perfectly. And then this man comes up that's like filling up his water bottle. And there's a shot of this. And he's just like literally staring at them. And like the water bottle is now at this point full. Like, so now you just see the water like overflowing in the water bottle. And he's just like literally gawking at them, staring at them. And I got that shot in and I was like, are you good? And he was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. This is just so beautiful. So I was like, okay, I love that. That's great. And then literally 10 minutes later, a lady comes behind us and she has to be probably in her 60s, this black lady. And she goes in and starts saying like Bible scriptures and like, oh God, this guy, that, that's disgusting, this, da, 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 da. And then we literally just like sat there. Cause for me, anytime I'm shooting and I see something, like I have to say something for me. Like, especially if like my sitters are affected by it, I have to say something. I said, why is this disgusting? And I, me and her were like, not going back and forth. But I was explaining to her, I'm like, ma'am, I understand your opinions, but that makes no sense for you to try to come up and try to disturb our peace. And then later on, someone else came up to the park and like yelled out, love is love. And it was just so great that we were being embraced while somebody was trying to come up and like basically take away our shine and like make us feel bad about what we wanted to do. So that was just very, very all interesting. And that all happened within the span of 15, 20 minutes. And that's why I said, you got to love New York City. Wow. I mean, and, and this is an interesting echo of the ways in which, you know, we've observed and noted one another's kissing behaviors throughout history, which I know that you have documented, Cheryl, these expectations about who can kiss and how kissing looks. And these have roots in colonialism. Tell us about how kissing customs have been shaped by colonialism and racism. Sure. Well, we have accounts. One of the things I did while I was researching this book was to try to look at different writings of so-called explorers who were going to different parts of the world and experiencing life in communities that you know, not many Europeans had been to. And there's one account in particular where I remember supposedly this man was writing that he had fallen in love with the king's daughter of this community he was living amongst in part of Africa. And uh, at some point he describes leaning in to give her a kiss and to his horror, she runs screaming from the hut where they were. And only later does someone else inform him that she had never experienced mouth-to-mouth kissing before. And she thought by pressing his lips on her body in that way, he was interested in eating her. Oh, God. And so, you know, this means of connection, while we think about kissing as a behavior we all experience, the shape it takes, of course, is influenced by who we're interacting with in society and the images we see and how we're raised. And so the fact that, you know, you're working on these these photographs that sound beautiful of different types of people connecting, I mean, that can be such a powerful means to change our expectations about what it looks like for two people to show each other affection, regardless of, you know, how they identify or who they are. So, yeah, as you're mentioning, I mean, there are some assumptions about what is universal about kissing and what isn't. And I know that since your book came out, there has been this anthropology study that got a lot of attention that was showing that signs of romantic sexual kissing were found in only 46 percent of cultures around the world. That was really surprising to me. And it led to a lot of people arguing kissing is not actually a universal experience. What do you make of that? It really comes down to what we define as kissing. I think it's fair to say that, yes, not all cultures have kissed mouth to mouth and certainly still don't today, as that study pointed out. But I think, one, if we kind of take the Darwin perspective of saying, like, kissing is a socially significant means of human connection. As we look across the animal kingdom at different parallels and other species, I don't want to anthropomorphize. I don't want to assume that we can understand the emotions of other animals by their behavior, but we see Animals like bonobos sucking on each other's tongues for 10 minutes straight out of affection. We see chimpanzees hugging and, you know, tapping lips. We see things that look very similar for this means of connection. So I think with that kind of perspective, it is fair to say in some regard, it is a universal experience. Kadar, this project has really evolved for you over the years that you have been doing it. You mentioned that at a certain point, you really became interested in thinking more about what's going on more deeply here. So talk to me about some of these deeper threads that you're looking for when you're working on this project. I think one of the main points that I'm getting from this series that I'm learning is that kissing represents really freedom, especially for the core community in today's climate. 
yes, kissing is also universal, but there's still a privilege within kissing, depending on how you look and where you're from. I've even learned for myself that me being a cis man, I have a privilege of showing PDA with my song partner who happens to be a male or who happens to be a woman. We're now in a society where they're trying to shove us back in the closet. So I think this is the time now to really speak up and to be truly who we are and to show that. A seventh grade, Caitlin had watched enough ATL and high school musical to know that when her first kiss happened, it was supposed to have doves flying in the wings and sparks and fireworks, and there was none of that. There was an eighth grader who I had the biggest crush on. There's no way he didn't know I had a crush on him. I was always staring. And I think there was one time that we were playing outside. We had both gone in to get water. I'm pretty sure he went in to go get water and I followed him. And I walked up behind him and he asked me my name. I told him. After that, we chatted for maybe a few minutes and he kissed me. It wasn't anything special. There was tongue. I think our tongues might have explored each other's mouths for a second or two. And that was it. We went on about our day as if nothing even happened. I was in seventh grade and my friend was like, oh, this guy likes you. And I was like, oh, why not? One time he was walking me towards class, which is like a tradition at our school for boyfriends and girlfriends to do, even though we weren't dating. And when he dropped me off at class, he let go of my hand and he turned and just kissed me. All I literally remember is him walking away and I just felt like a dab of spit on my mouth. And I was a bit disgusted. It was not how I imagined my first kiss to be. And to make it even worse, it was in the middle of the classroom. So I was sitting right in the center of the classroom and everybody saw it happen. And I was extremely embarrassed. That was Caitlin and Janine. They both worked with our radio station's Youth Reporting Institute. While I got my first kiss when I was a grade older than they were, that was also a few decades ago. So as we were working on the show, I really started to wonder if kissing behaviors have changed at all since I was in middle school. Is kissing in a hallway a whole different ballgame when everyone has a cell phone? Are movie theater makeouts still that much of a big deal? I asked three other current and former youth reporters to school me. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Williams. I am a sophomore at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hi, my name is Paris Smith. I'm currently in the 12th grade and I go to Riverside High School. Hi, my name is Donna Diaz. I am a junior at Riverside High School. Um, I feel like I was a late bloomer. Like everyone in my friend group already had their first kiss. So with the boy that I was talking to at the time, um, we went to the movies for a date and we went to go see Sonic the Hedgehog 2. <laughs> and we were sitting in the movie theater and like he was just like talking to me, being like, oh, I like you so much. Like, will you be my girlfriend? And I was a sophomore at the time. So I was like, oh, my God, like, yes. like. <laughs> and um, we're watching the movie and I'm looking straight at the movie. And then I feel these eyes like upon me and I'm like "Mm, I know if I look at him right now it's over (laughs) like so I just like do a quick glance and he keeps looking at me and I continue to look at the movie and I'm like okay I'm just look at him and he like dives like (laughs) not even like a you know romantic way where like we're both leaning in he dives to me and like we kiss and I'm like oh my god like Sonic is literally like jumping through hoops like (laughs) like I don't know why this person just smashed his face on mine (laughs) Paris how about you what was your experience well I unfortunately was an early bloomer I remember being in pre-k and (laughs) this boy named Raheem he was like a friend of mine in pre-k and 
I didn't even have no feelings towards the boy, but we were on the playground and he just came up to me and just smashed his face <laughs> into my face. And it was very uncomfortable. He just walked away and I was just standing there dumbfounded. And I was like, what is what is going on? And ever since that situation, he just act like it never happened. But I remember that day. <laughs> I remember it. We remember your yeah. first kiss. OK, Chris, how about you? All right, so I was 16, and so it was with my girlfriend at the time. A couple weeks before, we had been able to play with some of our friends at school. And so, like, I had tried, and it was kind of like what Donna was saying, where it was like I was looking at her, but she wouldn't look at me. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to do that because I don't want to push anybody's limits. I don't want to do that. So then um, one day we were at a birthday party, and we were hugging, and I was about to go home. And we were just standing there, and I was looking at her, and then I looked at my phone to see if I saw my mom was there, and I looked back up to tell her that, and she just kissed me right now. So, <laughs> How did you navigate it after that first one, Chris? After the first one, like, since that was my girlfriend, I knew it was kind of understood between us that, like, we could kiss. It was okay. But, like, with other people, it hasn't really been like that because I actually haven't kissed anyone else besides her. It takes a lot for me to get that close, get that intimate with somebody. But my biggest fear is making somebody else uncomfortable and getting that reputation as he doesn't respect people's boundaries. And it's like, it's a power dynamic since I'm a dude in a relationship. Yeah. So it's like, I'd rather ask somebody first or like get actual verbal consent and know 100% that they're okay with that than like, oh, I'm sorry, I did that. I appreciate that. And it's not the like coded language. Like I remember before my first makeout session, my high school boy, no, my middle school boyfriend AIM'd me, like, make sure to brush your teeth with an emoji. And I was like, that is so <laughs> pathetic. And, like, such an indirect way of communicating something like that. So I'm all in for the direct communication. I really appreciate that. How do you talk about, like, first kisses and intimacy? Is it something that you process with your friends and have support around? My friend group chat, oh, my. Oh, my God. We be telling each other, like, oh, guess what my partner did? Oh, he just kissed me. Or, like. He gave me flowers. It's like little things we would tell each other. It's kind of like we're rooting each other on from the sidelines. Like yeah. they're my cheerleaders and I'm their cheerleader. So it's very supportive. Like I really trust them. Did y'all grow up in families where kissing was common? Like you saw your parents kiss or like had examples of kissing around you? Mm-mm. No. No? Mm-mm. Just something that wasn't ever on the table. Mm-hmm. How about you, Donna? Same as Paris, like my family, it was very private. When my parents were together, I only saw them kiss like maybe once or twice or maybe in photos. My mom taught me that those type of moments and intimacy should be private. And so with my first partner, when I told him that, I was like, I don't like PDA. I don't like this. He felt like, oh, like, are you embarrassed by me? Like, why don't you want to kiss me in public? And I'm like, no, it's not it. It's just I was raised a certain way where um, I don't feel comfortable kissing you in front of my friends or family. And like my mom enforced that. I remember I invited my partner at the time to my house and she told me, I don't want to see kissing, hugging, no touching. So it was like that her voice was in your head yeah. very much so. Yeah. How about for you, Chris? My family, I feel like my parents, I like I couldn't count on one hand the number of times that I've seen them kiss. But when they did kiss, it was usually either like a very special moment for them or it was like a joke, like to make me and my sister say, ew, like they kissed me. <laughs> but then also the same thing where even though they would kiss, like they wouldn't go do that in the street. Like we're not going to be in Walmart on the checkout line and they're just going to start kissing because it. Yeah, PDA to me was shown as, like, that's a little bit tacky. Like, you don't need to do that in the street. And it's still, when I'm walking around, I might see a couple on campus or something cuddling in the street. And I'm like, are you for real? I know that one of y'all has a room. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. You have a room. You should just go there. So, I mean, y'all have had very differing experiences, like, coming into this first kiss moment and then how you've kind of grown up thinking about kissing but I'm curious about like how would y'all describe what makes a good kiss for you in this moment I'll start with you Chris hey okay (laughs) I guess just comfortability like not on the first go around you don't need to be that doesn't need to be tugging all that like it could just be sweet for a couple seconds the first time and then like 
the same thing. It should be kind of private. It should definitely be private. Like, I guess you just kind of have to match energy. If it's heated in the moment, I guess go for it. But like, if it's just like, we just had a conversation and then it's happening, it shouldn't be like right straight to it. It totally needs to be in private. It shouldn't be tongue and- <laughs> No leading with yeah, the tongue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please no, please no. Just take it slow. It's kind of like a, I guess a roller coaster. Shouldn't be guns blazing at first. No blazing guns. Noted. Honestly, what surprised me the most in this conversation was that they all seem much more reserved about kissing than most of the people I was around in high school and early college. I don't know what that means, if anything, but I'm going to keep thinking about it, and I will report back. In the meantime, I'm planning to commit to kissing more, something that reduces stress and gives you all the positive hormones. Count me in. If you want to jump on this train with me, I've got just the thing to set you up for success. The three things I think make a great kiss are chemistry, rhythm, because I've definitely have had chemistry with certain individuals, but they did not have rhythm. So the kissing experience was not great. And then um, touch for me, like I like having my hands on like their head, on their face, things of that nature, just know like the different comfort levels of touching. The three things that I think make for a good kiss are one, preparation. If you want it to happen, take care of your personal hygiene. Uh, that second piece is about comfort, uh, making sure that you understand what the other person might want, not putting any pressure on that partner. Or if you're feeling uncomfortable yourself, maybe putting on the brakes because it's not the right moment and your body isn't going to respond as, as well as it could. And then third, one of the best parts about that first kiss is that dopamine kick, that craving and desire. And that rises with anticipation. So it's gonna feel wonderful in the right circumstances. Embodied is a production of North Carolina Public Radio WUNC, a listener-supported station. This episode was produced by Kaya Finlay and edited by Amanda Magnus. Paige Perez is our new Embodied producer, Madison Spire is our intern, and Jenny Lawson is our sound engineer. Quilla wrote our theme music. Check out the show notes for a link to Kadar's gorgeous photos and Cheryl's book. Also, a huge thanks to everyone who shared their first kiss stories with us. If you have a story to share with us, thoughts about a recent episode, or ideas about a topic you want us to cover, leave us a message at our virtual mailbox speak pipe. Find a link in our show notes. Until next time, I'm Anisha Rao, taking on the taboo with you.